everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Brian Selvey, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Today's topic is bridging systems engineering and multi-fidelity analytical models. Given the number of participants, I can see this is going to be a great topic uh, with great interest. With us, uh, with, with this, um, we have two subject matter experts who you may recognize. But before we start our presentation and meet our presenters, there's a couple of housekeeping items that I need to cover. First, we are recording this webinar for your reference later. Second, you will see a control panel that is typically on the right side of your screen. You are muted by default, but we encourage you to ask questions. Please submit your questions in the questions window and we will answer them during the presentation or during the Q&A session at the end. Lastly, we will ask three poll questions today during the webinar, and we will share those results so you can see how others respond. Please watch for the pop-up window when it's time for the polls. With that, let's meet our presenters. Today, we are joined by Steve Cash from Zook and Vitek and Alexander Luke from ANSYS. Steve is the Director of Customer Enablement at Vitek where he is responsible for the development of systems engineering and product training materials for team members and customers. Steve is a certified systems engineering professional through the International Council on Systems Engineering, or INCOSI. He has spent 25 plus years developing his systems engineering skills through experiential learning. While his experience is broad, he has spent the majority of his time in the automotive sector supporting the development of engine controls, transmission controls, suspension controls, and lithium ion batteries. His roles over the years have ranged from electrical engineer to project lead to subject matter expert to manager. Steve holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Marquette University, and he is also a graduate of the INCOSI Institute for Technical Leadership. Second, we have Alexander Luke, and he is an application engineer for Model Center at ANSYS, handling pre and post sales activities with overarching, the overarching goal to expand the company's operations in Europe. Being well-versed in model-based systems engineering, Alexander took the opportunity to join INCOSI and GFSE, uh, which is the German chapter of, of INCOSI in early 2021. Welcome, Steve and Alexander. Thank you for being here today. And let's go ahead and get started. So with that, let's go to the next slide. So here's our agenda for, for today's webinar. We'll start with setting the context and introducing the challenge, moving on to the system model and enabling analytics. Next, we'll be integrating analyses using Model Center, then design space exploration from conceptual to detailed design. And of course, we will leave some question, time at the end for questions. Next slide. So with that, we will open up and we'll start with our first poll question. So what type of modeling are you doing during development today? And you can select more than one. You'll see four options here. The last is other. And if none of these fit uh, your current applications, please go ahead and vote other and let us know in the chat what, uh, what, what types of other um, uh, modeling you're using today. All right, so poll has been closed and the results are here. So 64% doing systems modeling with some using other types of modeling, 4% other. And again, uh, let us know uh, uh, what type of modeling in the chat if you'd like to uh, share that with us. Uh, Steve and Alex, any, uh, any thoughts on the results here? Anything uh, speak, speak to you? Yeah, I, I, thank you. Systems modeling being at the top of it, um, it, it surprises me a little bit. Um, my experience has been mostly in the design, modeling, analytic, and software side of things. So uh, I, I'm really happy to see that systems modeling is becoming more prevalent uh, out there in the industry. Great. Well, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Steve. All right. I'm going to start today's presentation with setting the system context and the challenge. And this is really talking about the specifics of the device, the product that we're going to be talking about. It is an auto injector. 
and you may be really familiar with these or you may not, depending on your circumstances. But they're devices that allow people to self-medicate rather than using syringes with a device that can control the volume that gets administered and how the medication gets administered. Um, it automatically delivers a drug formulation for the specific treatment of various diseases. Probably most prevalent that you may have seen, certainly for myself, is in dealing with insulin and, and uh, diabetes. Uh, it's really there to support, uh, you know, the, cu the customers with the convenience of being able to deliver insulin. Next slide. Some of the challenges of these auto injector systems are that they're trying to design them to manage multiple um, medications. So when you look at the variation in medications and what effect they have on a system design, I'm actually going to work kind of backwards on my list here. That delivery, that bolus shape, is the amount of medication that you need to deliver at a rate of delivery over a given time. So all the different medications that can be delivered by these auto injectors have different delivery um, goals. Now, what else affects that then very much is related to the medication itself. itself the molecule size, the fragility of the, the medication, the concentrations of the medications, the volumes of the med uh, medications, and the temperature effects. So most of these medications are stored in refrigerators or at certain temperatures to maintain their lives, and then getting them to the right temperature for delivery. So that's kind of the challenge of these systems and the system that we're going to be talking about. We're going to move from there then into exploring the system model and what we've modeled and the various things that we need to do to enable analytics across the systems model. I'm going to start with a very quick view of Vitex systems engineering framework, and this ties to Genesis, our modeling tool, is that on the right-hand side, you have a, a model definition of the various elements of systems engineering be it a requirement, a component, a function. It's very much in the natural language of systems engineering, and therefore, we call it the systems definition language. That language not only talks to the entities and the elements, but also how they relate. You can see there in the middle, a component performs a function. It's very much the natural language of systems engineering. This systems definition language then becomes the underpinning of the systems engineering effort. When you look at the, the diagram on the left, that systems definition is the foundation. And it's the language that we're going to be talking as we move through the development of the product. It doesn't mean that we don't talk other languages, but this is the primary one we use for modeling. The goal is to be able to integrate all the different pillars there that you see from program management requirements, functional architecture and behavior, structural architecture, verification validation, and specialty en engineering into that language so that it can pull the information and enter the information back and forth to an overall model. Fundamentally, it becomes then the underpinning of various analysis and to the views and viewpoints that our stakeholders may have. So being able to generate different uh, types of views and dip with different sets of information for different people and ultimately becomes that link to your digital engineering tools. Next slide. I start this process with requirements, but if we really look at engineering as a whole, we don't always start with requirements. Oftentimes it's a back and forth. The goal is to hit those pillars that ride on top of our system definition language and I'm just going to go through them kind of in a, a kind of a normal top-down order. But we're going to talk about requirements here. And there are eight requirements. For the purposes of our discussion today, we're only going to focus really on three of these and how they weigh into the analytics. That will be the production cost, the barrel safety factor, and the injection time. And you'll notice that two of them truly are system-level requirements. 
but the barrel safety factor is really already a component level requirement. And that goes from the, st the, the standpoint that sometimes we don't always work truly from a top down. Sometimes we're looking at an existing design or have an existing understanding and working those requirements in both directions. Now what's important is now that I've captured my requirements to turn around and parameterize those requirements. So what do we do? We go in and define a set of parameters. In this case, the names AI price, barrel safety factor, and AI injection time are there to give values, numerics that we can use in our analytics. Min and max tying to our requirements our objective being a target for our design team. The design field then can be a capture of our design values. And then our observed and precision values can capture our verification and potentially a larger sample size of our, our end product and analyzing it against the requirements. Display them here as blocks. And those blocks really are block representations of the requirements but showing the parameterized value, AI price of $9, the objective, barrel safety factor of four, and the AI injection time of nine seconds. That gives us parameterized requirements. The next view that I'm gonna give you in the display of information is from a structural standpoint, and this is setting the very highest level of system context. I have four components in this context my system of interest, the auto injector, and then a number of externals that are going to interact with that auto injector, the fridge, the sharps container, the user. So this is the highest level of our system looking at it in its context. We can take these and parameterize the components, if you will, the parts of our system. Those same parameters, AI injection time, AI price, you see here. But there's also additional parameters that we may want to capture as part of our analysis, part of our design activities. Height, length, width. Mass was another requirement that I didn't cover, but it shows up there as tied to this component, our system component. On the external side, the fridge has temperature. Again, no values exist for those because we're going to let them come out of the analysis but fundamentally we are setting ourselves up so that our components and the various components of the system have parametrics tied to them. These are the same parametrics then that can be bound to the requirements so that we maintain consistency. My requirements and my components have numerics assigned to them. We move from structural and understanding our, our physical constructs into discussing functional architecture and behavior. And I start with use cases. And I'm not gonna parameterize any use cases, but it is a discussion from the highest level of functionality so that we can identify what we're gonna focus on. In this case, you have the auto ejector system in the center and the actors of user fridge and sharps external to your system. And we have some very high level definition of functionality. Cool the drug, inject the drug, assemble disposable unit, check temperature status, dispose of disposable unit. Now, some of these functions, they're abstract in nature and kind of cross the boundary a little, but it's meant to have kind of the discussion around these particular behaviors. We're gonna focus on inject drug is that injection time is critical there. We take that and we look at it more from a detailed perspective we create a behavioral thread. You can very quickly look through this diagram and see that I move from the user and the auto injector and talk about the injection sequence. Remove the cap, expose the needle, place the system on the injection site, push the system firmly against the skin, penetrate the skin, press the activation button, or unlock the device, then press the activation, uh, activation the injection sequence, inject the medication, receive the medication, indicate end of injection, acknowledge end of injection, remove from skin, check medication window, apply pressure 
uh, with cotton gauze, replace cap, cover needle. So it kind of gives you a, a sequencing. Now I chose an EFFBD diagram, be it an activity diagram or a sequence diagram. You could display it in any others, but the goal is to understand that sequencing of events. Now, the important piece here, looking at that inject medication, is really what's critical to delivering the medication. And again, I have parameterized the function of inject medicine under the, the skin with that injection time. Nine seconds is our target. And understand that it's really just for that function that's critical to the performance of the system, that nine seconds. We can add parameters of time to all of the, the functions to really understand the full sequencing. But from a requirement standpoint, the criticality is delivery of the medication in that time window. Now that's our behavior and, and this is all our top level, first level of things. We now move down a layer. We're gonna go into our structural architecture and define things much, much more. And I'm not gonna go through the full detailed breakdown of this, but you can see this is the architecture. I have a auto injector portion and I have a disposable drug barrel unit. So that's been architected out of the design and I have these components. We turn around and parameterize these and you can see then everything has a set of parameters associated with it. For our primary focus today, we're gonna to focus on the barrel unit and look at the, the specifics there. You can see here the barrel safety factor, the third one from the bottom, comes straight from our requirements. The rest of this is coming out of our detailed analysis. So we'll be able to use these values and pull back data from our analysis so that we can write proper specifications for our components if we're handing them off to a sub supplier or contractor. Now, once we've parameterized everything, the key is to connect these parameters. And so we create what's called constraint definitions. These are simple uh, connections of the inputs and outputs and how they relate. In the case of system cost, it's a simple addition. The equations show that. It's a, the uh, AI price equals the core AI cost plus the disposable unit cost. And those two costs are then just a simple addition of their sub costs. So that's cost, it's a simple add up. Two other analysis that's gonna be working in the background here is our glass safety factor and our injection time. Those calculations are more complicated and really are at the heart of why we do analytical models. And so we call them external calculations. The output then is the parameter that we're going to get back from that calculation. And the various parameters we have there as inputs to that calculations or they can actually be bi-directional in that we're going to capture that information as a result of the analysis as well. But they set up that relationship between the inputs and outputs so that we can execute the analysis in the tool. I think we're on to a poll question here. Great, thanks Steve. So I'll launch our next poll question. So what level of analysis do you perform prior to detailed design? Great. So here's our results. Steve, Alexander, any any thoughts based on the results? Uh, on my side, I can't see the results, so you have to tell me uh, what are the scores, if you want me to comment. Uh, yeah, so looking at it, um, certainly, I'd like to see the extensive increase over time, right? We do more analysis up front. Uh, it's at 18%. We have some at 41%, not enough at 27%, which is not surprising. Um, none at 4% and don't know at 10%. Um, I, this is kind of where I expected the distribution to be at this point in time. Okay, great. So we'll move on and uh... I think it's over to you, Alex, right? Yes, I will take it over from here. All right. Well, uh, thank you to both of you. Thank you, Steve, for uh, introducing the system engineering framework uh, and trying to describe the first steps in capturing the, the system architecture. Uh, on my side, I will be focusing on how to integrate analysis using Model Center first. 
Um, so the goal is to show you how ANSYS can help you bridging the gap between systems engineering and simulation or analytical models. So um, this slide will, will be reused actually during the entire presentation and I will try to enrich it. So you will have to read it from left to right. So you can see that I'm trying to capture the entire product life cycle from conceptual to detailed design and then prototyping and testing. And you can see that there are two threads running in parallel. The one at the top is actually representing the systems architecture model uh, in Genesis. So that's what uh, Steve actually described earlier on. And the thread at the bottom try to represent the world of simulation with a wide range of simulation models. So my presentation today will aim at describe how to connect the two worlds that have been historically disconnected. Um, so the step one has been described by uh, Steve already. Now I will actually describe the, how Model Center can actually um, help you automate your, your, your simulation models. Um, the, the third step will be actually showing you how the bridge works. So how can we actually uh, connect the simulation models to the system model created in Genesis? And then how can the system engineer take advantage of this connection in order to carry out trade studies? Um, so again, that's not the full picture that we intend to represent here. Um, the idea is then to connect this infrastructure to the digital backbone, to PLM, SDM, or material data management tools, for instance. They are not represented, but they could really well be appended to this um, representation. So as Steve was saying, there are some simple mathematical expression that we capture um, in constraint blocks in Genesis, but uh, we are really quickly actually facing some limits. And there are some models that we need to connect to the system model in Genesis in order to verify the requirements. We will need a cost model to compute the cost of the borrower component. We'll need a fluid model to simulate the pressure map applying on the borrower wall. And we'll need a structural model to calculate the glass safety factor. So in order to do that, we used a couple of tools, Excel and two NC solvers here, uh, mechanical and fluent on the right. So model center, the model center tool is designed to flexibly implement model-based engineering processes originally. So with model center, engineers are able to create and maintain a library of simulation tools and engineering workflows. And with this tool, basically, the user is gonna be able to automatically execute I mean, a more or less complex workflows. So Model Center's open architecture allows to automate and integrate any, almost any engineering tools. So for conceptual, uh, most of the time 0D, 1D, but then as we move into detailed design can be 3D tools, uh, NCs and non ncs solvers, CAD tools, um, to, name, to name a few examples here. And for these projects, for the conceptual stage, we have been working with the one-way fluid structure interaction workflow. Um, so there is a CFD calculation that is being performed first using Fluent, uh, and then the result, the pressure map, is being fed into a mechanical solver to analyze the structural deformation on, on, of the barrel, and based on that, to compute the glide safety factor that is constrained in the system model. So again, NC solvers have been used here and automated in Model Center. Model Center will orchestrate the execution of those solvers, but again, other third-party tools could have been used to replace those. So at this stage, when conceptual, we're using uh, 2D solvers, uh, 2D models. It's taking only a few minutes to run. Um, so that's that's okay. We're not facing big challenges at this point. And the same, I mean, a similar workflow has been created to capture and to automate the Excel components, calculating the glass, uh, the barrel glass cost. So those workflows have been published on a server that will be accessible by others, and among them, the systems engineer. So we're moving into step three. How do we connect those workflows to Genesis? So Model Center has a plugin that is available inside Genesis, but also in, inside other uh, modelers. Again, it's an agnostic solution, so like Capella or Rhapsody, for instance. And when you start the plugin, the first thing is that this plugin is gonna consume relevant information defined in the system model. It's gonna read the structural elements, the constraints, and the requirements. Then the plugin will offer the possibility to connect the automated simulation workflows that you created to the system model. So I will try to actually detail the steps in the video in the next slide. Um, so we have to perform a mapping between the input and output of the simulation model and the parameters captured in the system model in Genesis. And 
I mean, after performing this integration, the system engineers are not going to be able to orchestrate the execution of various multidisciplinary simulation models directly from inside Genesis in order to verify the requirements, perform what if analysis, but also trade between different objectives or architectures. So I prepared only one video as a demo today, so I'm going to try to be uh, as detailed as possible in this video. So we're going to start off uh, by showing the Genesis model. So as we can see, we parameterized um, the structure. So we can see that our different components have some parameters. Some of them are linked and constrained by requirements that also have their set of parameters. Um, then I'm going to show you some constraints. So uh, the parametric diagram that aims at calculating the auto-injector cost, as Steve described. So these formulas can be captured by Genesis. And then you can see here that the model center plugin is available in Genesis. So we can select which part of the models we wish to export, uh, which types of blocks we want to export as well. So again, the first thing is that model center is consuming this info. So it's representing the system model structure elements. Based on the constraints and parameters that you define in Genesis, Mole Center is going to automatically create a set of scripts that can be executed. And also, you're going to be able to visualize the requirements that you define in the system. Then the interface is really user friendly. So you can actually take any kind of analysis that is available, drag and drop it into your execution plan, and it's going to automatically identify what are the inputs and outputs of the Genesis model that are at stake. So in doing that, we can actually run the parametric diagrams. Uh, so we had a visual representation of it in Genesis, and now we can actually run it and calculate the output. Now we want to, to connect more complex workflows to it. So here you can see that I'm connecting to a remote server where my FSI workflow has been um, saved. So I can actually point to the location of my automated workflow and I'm seeing it as a black box, so I can only see the inputs and outputs of the model. I don't want to duplicate the models. On the left-hand side, I see the parameters um, created in the Genesis model, and I will have to perform this parametric map mapping between the Genesis model on one side, the source of truth, and the variables contained in my simulation models. Model Center offers also an auto-link feature that uh, recognizes actually the variables that have and the parameters that have the same names on both sides, and offers you to create the links automatically. So I imported the FSI workflow doing uh, this way, and now I'm going to import uh, the, the barrel glass cost analysis. So same way, I'm pointing to the black box. I'm seeing the input and output of the simulation model, and I'm performing the mapping here. So those analyses actually could be replaced, can automate any kind of simulation tool. I can drag and drop them into my execution plan. And again, it's going to pull over automatically all of the parameters that are at stake in those analyses. I also want to use this tool to verify the requirements. So here, um, we constrain some parameters and going to try actually to verify if for this configuration, this design configurations, those requirements are satisfied. So you can see that I have three of them here, uh, the auto-injection time, the glass cost, and the glass safety factor. So in total, I have six analyses to run, and you're going to see that actually the system as engineer can change some input values if he wants in green and run the workflow automatically from Genesis. So he doesn't have to create a workflow. Most center will actually call the different models and execute, I mean, call the for the execution, for them to execute um, and uh, make sure that, I mean, the inputs are going to be sent to the model and the outputs are being brought back uh, to uh, to be used for the downstream analysis. So in this view, you can see actually the results of uh, the simulation. You can see if the values have gone up or down in comparison to the baseline value that is uh, that has been defined in Genesis. And more importantly here, I will zoom in, you can see the status for each requirement that you wish to verify. So here, for instance, we see that the safety factor requirement is not satisfied. So the system engineer will have to rework the architecture or the baseline in order to satisfy it. So uh, now we'll jump into the um, second part of my presentation, which is actually touching on the design space exploration from conceptual to detailed design. So the step four of this process is actually being able to run trade studies to explore the design space on the system level. So Mole Center, uh, as you can see here, 
the plug model center plugin in Genesis uh, has um, the you have the possibility using it to set up a design of experiment. Um, so you will select the inputs, the design variables that uh, you want to set up with the boundary conditions. Uh, you can specify the response variables. So again, it can be the constraint parameters. It can be important KPIs for your system. You can uh, choose the design method that you use to uh, populate the design space, the number of runs. And more Center will actually be able to uh, export the design space and run all of the configuration automatically and will gather all of the results in such data explorer table. So Molo Center comes also first a wide range of post-processing tools and visualization tools that I'm not gonna uh, actually show today, where the user can set objectives, constraints, analyze output sensitivity, identify optimal design candidates, for instance. And in this project, it's been really useful for conceptual stage to relax or refine requirements and to pre-configure string attributes for later design iterations. So at this point, I've been able to identify a um, good baseline uh, uh, configuration, and I will be able actually to send the results of the simulations back to Genesis, and it will populate the design column that uh, Steve talked about earlier in this presentation. So I'm going back to my main frame here. So I've been telling you how to basically uh, use NC Small Center to connect to bridge the gap between simulation and systems engineering, but it was only for conceptual phase. The idea here and the question is, can one maintain this framework as we go into detailed design phase, as we gain more complexity on the system model, but also on the simulation side? And I will actually describe that in the next slide. We want to go down the component level this time. We're gonna actually use some uh, catalogs for the spring, for the material used for the barrel components. And we're going to see if it's still possible to connect uh, the simulation to the system model. What are the challenges and what are the, the, the perspective and the, um, the possibilities offered by such connection? So the simulation side, uh, we moved into detailed design and we moved from one way fluid structure interaction to two way fluid stru structure interaction. So it's much more challenging to implement and to ensure actually that it is robust enough and parameterized the model. Uh, in order to introduce some parametric variation. And that's the goal. We want to be able to modify the design. So the two FSI model needs a system coupling tool because it's not a succession of I run the fluid model and then the mechanical. There will be actually a, a back loop where the results of the mechanical analysis are fed back for the fluid uh, analysis. So NCS Workbench has been used to perform this coupling. Um, here you can see that the models are complex, 3D models. It took us hours to run such models. And before, for conceptual, only a few minutes. But it is an important model as it is actually um, calculating the total injection time with a good accuracy. And we saw together that is a critical parameter in our study. So using the systems engineering approach, you realize that you need to not get stuck on the component, stuck on the component level. You need to connect the disciplines together and perform system level simulation. So we need to reduce this model in order to be able to run it in a matter of seconds in the system model. So we have been able to create a surrogate model using NCS OptiSlang, another NCS tool. And then we used Model Center again as a gateway to connect this reduced model to the system model in Genesis. So on the right hand side here, you can have you can see a view of the Model Center plugin inside Genesis again. It looks much more complex now as we went into detailed design. We have more system parameters at the top. So that's the parameters that Steve had to create first when he, pre when he presented this slide, right? Not only the parameters constrained by the system, but also others needed for design. Uh, and you have more analysis as well. So the goal is to show that this interface is really modular and that the solution is scalable. So here you can see that we replaced actually the one-way FSI model by the two-way one. So we've been able to toggle off this analysis and to select the new one. We have been also able to connect and integrate additional simulation models to Genesis uh, through Model Center. So you can see here that we actually uh, connected a catalog for the material choice, and you can see the options available uh, in the parameter in the mat for the barrel material parameter, polycarbonate, polyethylene, etc., as well as for the spring type. So based on that, we've been able to carry out further design exploration studies 
based on these more advanced uh, simulation models. So the trade studies here helped us to identify a set of potential optimal design candidates. We only carry out deterministic analysis here, which means that the drug temperature during injection was constant. Um, so we can see here a view of one of the 3D plots that can be generated using Mole Center. Uh, the gray points are all of the design configurations that we tested out that are failing at meeting at least one requirement. And then we color the, the, the other points based on the objective, so the cost and the performance of the system. So on top of that, we realized that it was important to uh, carry out a reliability check, at least, uh, to discriminate between the different candidates because the drug temperature during the injection is not always at room temperature, right? So we carry out a Monte Carlo analysis and you can see the diff different results for different uh, potential candidates here. Um, so you can see that some of them are really doing bad when uh, we change the drug temperature. Um, and that actually, actually provides really good um, information to the system engineers as we may need to change the design and the way we deal with uh, different temperatures as we develop our solution. Um, so it's a simple prototype. Again, the idea would be to carry out more advanced reliability analysis, taking, for instance, manufacturing uncertainty into consideration. Um, we had mis missing information about that for this project, so we stopped there. But the idea would be to consider that and then uh, actually to rerun the two FSI model uh, for final virtual validation. So the last slide on my side would be this mainframe again to show you how Genesis and NSYS can work together to uh, actually realize this vision of model-based system engineering that is spanning out from the conceptual phase to the prototyping and testing uh, and how Model Center can ensure the bridge, the connection between the world of simulation, that, that's where NCC is coming from originally with the solvers, and the system architecture model in Genesis. That being said, I will hand it over to Brian for the last poll question. Great, thank you, Alex. So here's the, the last poll question. Would, would trade studies improve your product design? All right, we'll close the poll. And here are the results. So yes is the overwhelming uh, winner. And maybe is is a close second. Um, any thoughts, Alex, on the results? Anything come to mind? Well, that's good. That's good that, that people think that trade, trade off studies could help them improving the uh, their, their system. Uh, the, the question to ask would be actually, are you currently using trade-off studies in your processes? Uh, and if you don't, yes, uh, we need to talk because I really believe that it can help you. And uh, that being said, Steve, I don't know if you want to add anything. <laughs> no, I'm 100% with you. And it depends very much on the, the products that you develop. Um, in some cases, trade studies may not help, but in a lot of cases where we're talking a lot about variability, um, evaluating multiple designs, there's no question trade studies can really, really help focus your product in. Great. All right. Uh, one last slide on my side. Uh, with Steve, we put together a list of three takeaways um, for this webinar. So if you have to remember three things that would be uh, those items here. The first one, enabling integration of multi-domain models. Um, so the system modeling that um, Steve described in the first part of the presentation is a key to successful integration of system models and multi-fidelity analytical models. Um, uh, <clears throat> and uh, its proper parameterization and constraints definition is important. The second aspect would be unlocking the promise of MBSC. So we talked about the model center solution that can actually enhance this MBSC picture by allowing you to connect any kind of simulation tool to the system architecture model. Uh, so again, there is no limitation that's really agnostic. Uh, so you can bring over the tools that you want. And last but not least, how you can leverage this framework to verify requirements and trade off between cost, performance, and risk. Um, so the goal is that when everything is integrated, you want to take a look at the system as a whole and the simulation models will help you training off between different performance metrics um, 
the analysis will help you to verify requirements. Um, and this approach can be used. It's really important to use it from the conceptual stage because this is at this point that you engage a lot of costs, but can be carried out then throughout the entire product life cycle. Great. Well, thank you, Alex, and thank you, Steve. So we'll move on to the question and answer phase of the webinar. And we've got a few questions that have been submitted so far. I'll start with those, but I uh, would um, encourage everybody to go ahead and submit questions through the questions tab in GoToWebinar if you have any of those, and we'll use that uh, also as part of this Q&A session. So to start, uh, and feel free either either of our hosts to or either of our presenters to respond. The first question is how is data related to constraints and requirement objects extracted and consumed by model setter and MBSE? All right, I think I will take this one. Um, so I told you that most center plugin in, in Genesis is actually uh, consuming the information defined in, in, in Genesis and um, for instance, the parametric diagram that Steve uh, defined um, could be executed directly in Model Center. So what's happening is that uh, there is a script, a JavaScript that is being generated based on the requirements definition, uh, on the, the boundary conditions for the parameters, or on the constraint uh, blocks and their mathematical expressions. Uh, and this JavaScript is actually uh, can be interpreted by Model Center. So there is a specific extension to that. So uh, these anal actually analysis are published um, locally on your machine. And when you bring up the plugin, um, these scripts are available and you can actually run them if you want. So this is how it works. Great, thank you, Ox. So we have another question now that's been submitted. Have you considered ways to save off multiple trade study results back to Genesis and capture notes regarding which result was selected for a design as well as why others were not selected? Sometimes there are multiple design candidates that meet requirements or no candidates that meet all requirements. Some design candidates are therefore more preferable than others and saving that rationale for the design parameters selected is useful from a knowledge management perspective. Uh, Steve, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and take that. Um, yes, we have considered it. Um, I think it's on the, the, the product roadmap for the future because um, you're absolutely correct. The idea of capturing the different candidate, not only architectures in Genesis, but even from a detailed design perspective, the idea of capturing that information, documenting your decisions, your rationales for choosing designs, uh, but it's something that it's Currently not in Genesis is the, the multiple parameters or multiple results for a given parameter, but it is something that we've got on our uh, future roadmap for, for the product. And uh, if I may, I will add to that. So that's uh, for the Genesis side. Uh, in the Model Center plugin for Genesis, you have the possibility to save the execution plans and the associated results as you run simulations. So uh, you could really well. Um, uh, you know, have a set of uh, five optimal design candidates. You can save uh, a snapshot of all of them in the plugin, um, but uh, you will keep it in the plugin, which means that you won't be able to send all of this configuration and to keep track of all of them in, in, in Genesis. But in Model Center, as you um, actually open the plugin, you will be able to visualize all of them. And now, when it gets to rational behind that, and adding a description based on, okay, well, uh, this is um, the optimal candidate A applying this rationale. We can't do that. We can just basically give a name to uh, the snapshot, let's say. So optimal results for use case one or et cetera. So that we can support. Great, thank you both. So our next question is, is it possible to create complex requirement analyses more than a simple comparison analysis to be run in Model Center MBSC? Um, yes, it is. So in this example here, we have been dealing with really simple requirements. So injection time must be uh, comprised between eight and 10 seconds, for instance. So uh, these kind of um, requirements 
um, you know, it's a, it's a basic comparison between uh, between uh, the computed value as a threshold, for instance. Um, it's easy to, and Mall Center will do that, generate a simple script based on these requirements. Now, if you're dealing with more complex use cases or if you have multiple parameters involved in a requirement, you can actually create uh, your script, your verification script on the fly in the Model Center plugin in Genesis, uh, where you can actually use uh, the parameters defined in the Genesis model, as well as point to the different requirements objects. So we can also actually um, address this, uh, this, uh, this use case with more complex requirements, yes. Great, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, so this next question is a bit more, more open-ended. So we've seen a couple examples today of, of how to, you know, some of the value that combining, connecting a, a system model to an analytical model can bring. Um, are there other use cases that come to mind uh, for, for both Alex and, and Steve where you could see that this combination of tools and capabilities would, would answer the mail and other sorts of use cases? Well, I, I definitely think um, we you know, demonstrated um, through uh, Alex's analysis is, is the value of being able to tie the whole thing together, your requirements, your, your component definitions, your specifications through that analytical means. And yeah, we focus on a lot of times on requirements and compliance to requirements. But what also it, it enables then is taking these parametrics back into the systems model and using the systems model to generate your you know, specifications or passing off even to other shareholders or stakeholders this information. You can pull in then manufacturing, you can pull in quality, and you can associate those same parameters and values from your designs with other aspects of your overall life cycle within systems engineering. Great, thanks, Steve. Alex, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think uh, Steve, uh, Steve's ans Steve's answer was was straight to the point, so I will leave it there. <laughs> Great. So the next question is, how much time would you allocate for a tr for a trade study? That's that's a really open question, so I can uh, I can start taking this one. It really depends, as, as Steve said, uh, trade trade off studies might make sense in most of the use cases, in most of the cases, in some doesn't. Uh, when it makes sense, you know, I strongly believe that it's important to screen your design space from the conceptual stage, because you need to be able to to kind of like use simulation to justify your architecture choice and um, the, the baseline configuration for your system. So since everything is integrated. Uh, the simulation with the system model, uh, it really makes sense to use it, I would say, as much as possible. No, how much time? It depends, right? Um, it usually doesn't take that long, right? Uh, since everything is fully automated. And then, uh, I mean, the results that you can generate based on these studies are just, uh, you know, like uh, you are saving a lot of money based on that. Um, so I would strongly encourage to use it as much as possible. But in terms of time, it's kind of strong to... Uh, to quantify, I would say. Yeah, it seems like it's very context dependent and, the, and the, it's dependent on the type of question you're trying to answer. Yep. So our last question, and I think we'll then move on to uh, closing comments. Our last question is, is for you, Alex, about the uh, integrations that you have with Model Center. What other uh, tool integrations do you support with Model Center? Um, so on the simulation side, uh, as I said, um, can be any kind of engineering simulation tool. Um, so again, from 0D, 1D to 3D, CA tools, CAD, uh, also connecting to SDM systems or databases, uh, really agnostic. Now on the system architecture modeling side, uh, we have off-the-shelf plugins, not only for Genesis, but also for uh, Rhapsody, Capella, it's a new one, uh, PTC windshield modeler and uh, Cameo. Uh, and that's about it for now, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Well, that wraps up the questions that have been submitted. Thank you to everybody for, for submitting questions. And uh, if you have any others, you know, as we move on, feel free to still submit them and we will follow up with via email uh, and, and respond to those later after the webinar. So that concludes our, our webinar today. And I'd like to thank Steve and Alex for sharing 
this interesting information with us. You can connect with both Steve and Alex on LinkedIn uh, at the links there to continue this conversation. The webinar itself will be hosted uh, and made available on the Zookin website by, by this Friday. Next slide. So this event, as we conclude, would like to remind you is part of Zookin's 2022 technical webinar series. Please visit our library of technical webinars on the web for more informational topics. The next webinar is going to be held on November 9th, and the topic is what's new in the E3 Series 2022. If you would like to register for that webinar or other upcoming webinars, you can do so at the link here provided. Please take a moment to let us know how we did on the exit survey. It's a quick, single question, and we would definitely appreciate your feedback. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attending today and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.